Okay, let's make a start. So welcome to the second Humanities Learning Center brown bag of this academic year. Um, today we have Jason Silaki, who's a faculty member in the history department at Delta College. Um, he's going to be talking about recent events in Afghanistan in an historical context. Um, the talk is entitled Afghanistan, the Graveyard of Modern Empires. Okay, hello. Uh, thanks everybody for joining okay, the brown bag discussion. So what I'm going to try to do is give at least some background for what's happened in the course of the last uh, couple months. Uh, but going back a ways to actually explain uh, really the tortured history uh, of this particular country uh, and the fact that it has been a process of tearing itself apart and having outside intervention come in to try to, you know, fix in quotes uh, the issues that are taking place there. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to share uh, a presentation so that you get a little bit more context because you'll see the pictures of regions that I'm talking about. Uh, some of the major people that uh, have had an influence on it, and a little bit of the politics of Afghanistan going back from the 1800s to current, because this is a long process for this country and this people. So let me do screen share and hopefully we'll be able to still have okay, the interpretation here. Okay. Sorry about that. You got a preview of what's coming. <laughs> okay, so we're looking at this today. This is okay, Afghanistan, the graveyard of modern empires. And just to give everyone an idea of where Afghanistan is, it's located in the Central Asia, just to the north of the modern state of Pakistan, to the east of Iran, the south of Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, uh, and then a close border uh, with India as well. Now this particular presentation, uh, it's for the Humanities Learning Center at Delta College uh, from the history with the Salagis. Uh, my wife and I have a blog, a podcast, uh, and we do different talks for Delta, SVSU, whoever would like them. So let's jump in to actually some context of what's going on. Uh, to give you an idea, the fact that uh, Afghanistan is a relatively recent state, meaning that it hadn't really been identified as Afghanistan itself until the mid 1800s. Before that, it had been different provinces for different kingdoms in Central Asia. Uh, Afghanistan, uh, the southern and eastern part of the modern country uh, is ethnically uh, related to the people in Pakistan. And so that's one of the reasons why Pakistan and Afghanistan have such a common uh, and I would say a hostile relationship with each other because uh, Pakistan too is a relatively recent country. Uh, it, wasn't, it did not exist until the late 1940s. And there were uh, disagreements as to where the border of Afghanistan began and ended when it came to Pakistan. And so that's gonna be a major reason why uh, in the 20th century, these two countries will interfere with each other so much. Um, if you're looking at uh, Tajikistan in the Northeast, that's gonna be another uh, area and another ethnic group inside Afghanistan. Uh, this country is made up of a number of different minorities, uh, ethnic minorities. And the thing that really just kind of keeps them together as a unified force is Islam, okay, the religion. Beyond that, uh, their ethnicity, their nationalistic characteristics still separate them, uh, even to this day. And that's why Afghanistan is in such turmoil as you have these different ethnic groups fighting for control of the entire territory. Uh, another major uh, ethnic group are uh, coming from Turkmenistan. Okay, so the Turks, uh, Uzbekistan, the Uzbeks are another ethnic group mixed in there. Uh, and for this area, when you're looking at this map, uh, as you're going through, the dashed red line that you see separate Afghanistan and Pakistan, 
Uh, this is called the Durad Line. This is a border division that was made between Afghanistan and British India in the 1880s. Okay. And basically what it was doing was it was dividing the tribal locations between Pakistan or between India and Afghanistan before Pakistan exists. Uh, when Pakistan and India split, that Duran line is still in theory uh, holding. But what will happen is Pakistan from the 1950s onwards wants a friendly government in Afghanistan. So what they will do is they will funnel money and weapons and fighters uh, into Afghanistan during times of uh, internal dispute in order to put what they would deem a friendly government in its place. Uh, this is how the Taliban comes into power is Pakistan is one of the big financiers and weapons brokers have put them into power. And then they also serve as a place of safety when the United States and NATO occupy Afghanistan after 2002. And with Afghanistan, it has a really varied climate and terrain. Um, when you see a lot of the uh, pictures, okay, when you're looking at uh, different regions of Afghanistan, if you're looking at the western part of the country, it's quite mountainous, it's quite arid, uh, it does not have a, a very steady rainfall where agriculture is something you could settle down and do all the time. So in those regions, you mostly have a lot of nomads. You have smaller villages, but you don't have the heavy reliance on farming. Now, when you get to the central part of the country and eastern part of Afghanistan, uh, closer to the Hindu Kush mountains uh, in the Himalayas, you get more rain and more snow. So the river valleys that are in this area are much more fertile. And this is where you see the major population centers. Uh, the cities of Afghanistan are located in this region. Um, and so you're looking at about 20% of Afghanistan's population living in the cities, the other 80% living in the rural areas, uh, whether it's in the east or the center, north, south, or west of the country. So 80% of that population, uh, for the most part, they look to themselves and their elders uh, to solve any disputes, whether it's uh, economic, political, uh, social. They work within their villages, within their provinces. And the central government based out of the city of Kabul is there, but it has to kind of buy these elders onto its side. And this is something that's taken place, uh, not just in the recent past, but in the 1800s as well. So the rural areas uh, operate semi-independently. And they're an area where there is a lot of unrest because they switch allegiances based on what is best for them. Uh, and this is something that will start uh, in 1850 and go all the way to 2020. Okay. Now, one of the main land routes to get to Afghanistan uh, is this Hindu Kush mountain range, uh, the Khyber Pass. Uh, you have a very mountainous region with very few roadways to get in. Afghanistan is landlocked. It does not have access to any ocean. So if you wanna get into the country, you either have to go overland through mountain passes or in the modern day, you fly in. Okay, in these particular mountain passes in the east and the south and the north, they are easily cut off uh, if there is conflict. It's easy for insurgents to either put uh, roadside bombs or set up ambushes uh, at key locations and basically destroy supplies before it ever gets into the country uh, to the locations that it needs to be. Uh, for the British uh, and the United States uh, in the 19th century and the 20 and 21st century, the Hindu Kush range is tough uh, because they cannot put a permanent military presence to protect every mile of that route. And so what happens is, is that the Afghan insurgents figure out where the main patrols are and they will hit those convoys after they get out of the protected area. Okay. And so the picture that you're seeing in the upper right-hand corner, this is one of the UN columns uh, that would be bringing in supplies of food, medicine, uh, ammunition, uh, occasional reinforcements coming in and they're being destroyed while they're in this column. 
usually what would happen is a roadside bomb destroys the first and the last vehicle in the column. And then the insurgents start destroying everything in between because there's no place for those vehicles to turn around. You can see how narrow that roadway is. Uh, the Soviets, they're coming in from the north when they're occupying Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989. They have the same problems, even though they're coming in from the northern part of the country. There are still very narrow mountain passes, very few developed railways or roads that they have to work with. In the picture that you're seeing at the bottom, those are Afghan insurgents that have shot down a Soviet transport helicopter. Uh, and they're using uh, much more advanced weapons than they would have available to them. Uh, the United States, uh, through the CIA, will funnel surface to air missiles to knock down Soviet transport helicopters and attack helicopters through the 1980s. Uh, and the Soviets, they suffer the same, they suffered the same type of casualties that NATO will suffer later on. But to give you kind of an idea of what the ethnic makeup of Afghanistan is and to show how multi-ethnic uh, and fracturous it really is, this map uh, is from uh, 2019. Uh, roughly you have about 31 million citizens in Afghanistan. Okay, and they're broken up into four really major groups, uh, depending regionally where they're at. You have the Pashtuns, who are in the south and the east of the country. Uh, these people are native to the land, uh, and they are also native to northwestern Pakistan. So this is where Afghanistan and Pakistan have always had this contested border. Who controls these people? Are they Afghans or are they Pakistani? Okay, you have the Tajiks who are in the north, okay, in the east and the northwest. Uh, again, the Turkish people that have migrated into the area over the course of centuries. Okay, the Harazans are in the central part. Uh, they are not really Pashtun or uh, Turkish. They are just uh, local Afghans uh, who would live there. And then your other group are the Uzbeks, uh, and they are concentrated in the northwest. But these are the major groups uh, that either have to cooperate or compete with each other for control of the country. And what happens is each one of these ethnic groups has its own outside sponsor, its own outside patron that will funnel in money and weapons and foreign volunteers when there are civil wars. Uh, and so you don't just have this internal conflict, you have larger powers being drawn into this region constantly. Uh, and that is going to have dire ramifications for the formation and function of this country. Now, trouble for the Kingdom of Afghanistan uh, really picks up in the 1800s. You have two major imperial powers competing for influence in territory inside Central Asia. Uh, in the south, you have Britain that is absorbing India uh, piece by piece. It's taking the smaller states and grafting it into what is called uh, the British Raj. Uh, it is an informal empire that the British control in India. So all of the goods, all the raw materials that are coming out of the Indian subcontinent benefit Great Britain. Uh, any of the finished materials that Britain is manufacturing, a lot of that will go into India and that's how they're boosting their economy. Uh, and India is, at that time, the richest colony that Great Britain has. This is a vital piece of territory that they cannot lose. The power that they're in competition against is Imperial Russia. Okay, Russia uh, cannot expand westward at this point. The only place it could expand is eastward and south. And so what happens is Britain starts uh, to fear that as Russia expands in Central Asia, starts taking all of these territories and just absorbing them into their empire, Britain starts to fear that Russia has plans to take India away. And if you're looking at this map, okay, the Kingdom of Afghanistan is this little kind of orange territory. And it is right between Russia coming from the north and Britain coming from the south. Okay, and neither Russia nor Britain want to directly control Afghanistan. What they want is to have a proxy allied government there. 
So they'd rather have the Afghans control their territory, but be loosely allied to one power or the other. This is what's called the great game. And what happens is, is that these Afghan kings, these Afghan rulers, they will basically make Britain and Russia vie for influence. If Britain wants Afghanistan to be allied, Britain has to provide them with money or weapons. If Russia wants to be allied with Afghanistan, they have to provide money or weapons. And so this Central Asian kingdom that kind of sits at the crossroads of trade uh, suddenly becomes one of the most strategically important places in Central Asia. And you have these two empires competing. And when the kingdom of Afghanistan kind of fragments due to internal dynastic struggle, Britain and Russia become much more active uh, where they actually will send in uh, armies to back up the claimant that they want on the throne. So in 1823, this kingdom of Afghanistan descends into anarchy. It shatters into all these different factions. Uh, you have about 13 different claimants to the throne, okay, from 1823 to 1839 that are competing with each other. They're all members of the royal family. They are all brothers who are competing against each other. The two most powerful ones are the ones who are pictured uh, on the slide. Das Muhammad Khan gains the most support uh, in the north and in the center of the country. He has the next largest claimant after him is Shah Sulji, uh, or Sal Suja, who is concentrating his power in the south, close to the border with India, British-controlled India. Uh, by 1839 or 1836, these are the last two warlords standing. And they're the ones that Britain and Russia are competing for, trying to figure out which one of these two will be the next king of Afghanistan. In which of the major empires, uh, which major empire will be the protector of this territory? You have a three year period where it's just these two fighting it out amongst themselves. Uh, das Muhammad Khan looks like he is going to be uh, the winner of this contest. He has more support. Uh, the people of Afghanistan prefer him. He is closer in league to Russia. And by 1839, he is viewed as too dangerous. And what ends up happening is the first Anglo-Afghan war breaks out. It's a three-year conflict from 1839 to 1842. Uh, Sa Shuja asks Britain to send a British Indian army to overthrow his brother. And in the process, uh, Shah Suja will become uh, a British ally. Now, this actually first part of the campaign is highly successful for the British. They're able to depose uh, Muhammad Khan. He goes into hiding and the British and Shah Suja are able to basically take the major cities of Afghanistan, but the countryside belongs to the insurgents. You have other issues for the British Empire uh, taking place that it's viewed as too costly to maintain a large garrison in Afghanistan to back their puppet up. They leave just a skeleton force in Kabul, the main capital, uh, and in Kandahar, and a, and a couple other of the major cities. But for the most part, they turn the fighting over to the Afghans, and this is something that is going to be a pattern from here on out. Foreign armies come in, they overthrow an Afghan government, they put their proxy in, and then after a while, the foreign army leaves and they expect the native Afghans to keep the proxy power there and it usually fails. Now, you have two years where Shah Suja is in control. He is technically the king of Afghanistan but the majority of the people do not follow him. They see him as nothing more than a puppet of the British and they want Muhammad Khan to come out of exile and be king again. And so in 1841, you have a nationwide insurgency breakout. What ends up happening between 1841 and 1842 is the British garrisons inside some of these cities have to retreat. They have to leave Afghanistan and try to march back to India the garrison of Kabul 
tries to make for the Khyber Pass, okay, that mountain path that connects Afghanistan and India, they're slaughtered to a man. Not just the soldiers, but the camp followers, the civilians who went with them trying to retreat back to India, they're wiped out. This first Anglo-Afghan war fails. Uh, Muhammad Khan comes back into power and Shah Suja is exiled, okay? He's kicked out. Uh, in Afghanistan, there is a negotiation, a ceasefire, where the English basically recognize Muhammad Khan as the leader, uh, but they're hoping that eventually he'll lose power. You have a period of about 30 years, uh, from 1842 to about 1878, where India and Pakistan have kind of normalized relations. Uh, but again, there's another British invasion of Afghanistan. They are invited in by rebels to come in and overthrow the sitting Afghan king. This is a two-year war from 1878 to 1880. The Afghan emir, the rightful leader of, of Afghanistan, Sher Ali Khan, asks the Russians if they would be willing in, to send a Russian army or Russian weapons and money in order to back up his regime. The Russian czar says no. The British end up sending in an army of 50,000 Indians and Brits into Afghanistan in 1878, and they end up overrunning the territory. They expel Sher Ali Khan. They install a new emir, okay, a new king for Afghanistan, Abdur Rahman Khan, okay, son of a former uh, leader. And what they're hoping is, is that this will prevent a civil war. This is where they actually split uh, Afghanistan and India's border, where they come up with that Durant line, okay, the split between these two countries. It's formed in 1880, and it stays until about uh, 1949, okay, where this division is. The British are able to put in their puppet government. They are able to control the economy of Afghanistan at this time as well, even though in theory, it's supposed to be an independent state. Now, what ends up happening is, is the second Anglo-Afghan war is actually a success for the British. They have a secure proxy monarch. They have control of the foreign affairs and economy of Afghanistan. And so for a while, the area is stabilized. Tensions between Russia and the British Empire are also starting to fade at this time because they're seeing a mutual enemy in Germany, in Europe. And so tensions and competition in Central Asia kind of die off between the two great powers and the great game dies off with it. Okay? And Britain is kind of seen as the de facto uh, ruler of this area. Now there's one more Anglo-Afghan war, and this is taking place in the immediate aftermath of World War I. Okay. Uh, what ends up happening is that the emir, the leader of Afghanistan, is assassinated, uh, and his son comes into power, and there is a question of whether he was responsible for his father's death or not. Uh, he does not have a secure reign. Uh, there's no guarantee that he will be king. And so what he decides to do is to unify his, his new title, his new crown, and get all of these different ethnic groups behind him. He decides to declare war against Britain over territory in what will be Pakistan. Okay, that line, that border that divided the tribal area of Afghanistan and India, he says that it's invalid. He wants to take the majority of Northwest India, what will be Pakistan, and absorb it back into the Kingdom of Afghanistan. So he starts a very brief and relatively unsuccessful war. It starts at the beginning of May 1919, and it ends in the middle of June 1919. What ends up happening is, is that the British send in an army, they send in the Royal Air Force, they bomb Afghan cities, but what ends up happening is, is that the British are forced to recognize this new king and recognize the fact that he is independent of their reign. They won't give him any of that Indian territory, but they give him the political recognition that he is an independent ruler. And this breaks away that idea of Afghanistan being 
uh, controlled by a foreign power. Britain is too busy trying to keep India in its empire. Uh, there are a lot of different riots that are taking place in India with Muslims and Hindus trying to push the British out of the territory. And Britain is strapped for cash. It's strapped for soldiers after the First World War. And they look at it as, we don't care about Afghanistan anymore and what happens there. India is the thing we need to control. Afghanistan can do whatever it wants. And after 1921, Afghanistan operates uh, in, into the late 1970s as its own independent kingdom. And for a little while, it's kind of chugging along. It's trying to stay neutral in world politics. Its government wants to modernize, but it doesn't want to get pulled into all these different alliance systems that are forming uh, after the 1940s. So from about 1950 to 1979, the Kingdom of Afghanistan is ostensibly an independent country. Uh, and its ruler, King Muhammad Zahir Shah, is uh, an independent ruler. He is not part of either a Western alliance system or an Eastern Bloc or Soviet alliance system. Afghanistan is relatively neutral in this. That starts to change though in 1979. In April of 1978, Mohammed Zahir leaves the country uh, in order to get medical treatment. And what happens is, is that all of these different uh, political parties that had been building underground uh, to oppose him, some are communist, some are socialist, some are democratic, uh, some are uh, Islamic in focus, they wait for him to leave. And when he does in April, they perform a bloodless coup and what ends up happening is you have uh, the Kingdom of Afghanistan transform into the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan. It's a communist regime. Okay. This is perfect for the Soviet Union, which is building alliance systems in Asia. Okay. Now all of a sudden there's this new friendly communist Afghan entity. This is a new state that could help shift the balance of power in Asia to the Soviet Union. As soon as this happens, Okay, uh, in it starts in about May of 1978, the Soviet Union starts sending thousands of military advisors into Afghanistan to support this new communist government. So they're helping them rebuild their army and rebuild their police system, rebuild their infrastructure. Uh, and the idea is the Soviet Union, they're looking at this new okay, communist government as independent, but allied to the Soviet Union. And for a little bit, uh, the Soviets are just sending material aid uh, and not directly interfering. The Soviets, if you're looking at this map, are, okay, the red. That's the Soviet Union. It's most of Central Asia. It's a good chunk, okay, of, okay, East Asia. The light purple, that is communist China. Okay, there had been a falling out in the 1960s between the Soviets and the Chinese, even though they're both communist, they don't agree on ideologies and they don't agree on which one is the dominant power in the communist world. So they're competing with each other. Afghanistan is this little yellow territory okay, that had been neutral up to that point. It is falling into the Soviet camp, okay, the Russian camp. The blue territory, that is Pakistan. It is not interested in having a communist regime in Afghanistan. It would rather see an Islamic Republic established there. Okay, so they don't want the communists, whether they're Chinese or the Russian in control. Okay, so Pakistan will pour money and weapons into getting okay, a Islamic Republic uh, a government set up in Pakistan from, or in Afghanistan from 1979 onwards. The United States is caught flat-footed by this, okay? Uh, we had been courting Afghanistan, trying to bring them into kind of a central uh, Asian alliance with the United States. And when this communist regime pops up in 1978, that throws it into confusion. Another thing that colors the United States reaction to this is the fact that the Shah of Iran is overthrown in 1979 by an Islamic revolution. Iran had been one of the cornerstone allies for the United States in the Middle East and Central Asia. The Islamic Republic of Iran 
is not friendly to the United States. So all of a sudden you have these two friendly states that have disappeared. Uh, one that is a communist state, one that is an Islamic state, neither of which are friendly to the US. So what ends up happening is, is that the CIA starts reaching out in both territories looking for resistance groups okay, who will oppose the new regimes that have come in. And this is how the United States gets more directly involved in Afghanistan. The first general secretary of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, so the first communist leader of this new regime, Nur Muhammad Tariki, he's assassinated by his second in command, who's also a communist. Uh, his name is uh, Hufizullah Amin, uh, and he is not necessarily friendly to Moscow. He's still, he's a communist, but he's looking at a way he could bring Afghanistan into the United States orbit. So the Soviets do not trust this guy. He's killed his leader, taken over that mantle, and they can't really guarantee whether he is going to be a proxy for Moscow. Leonid Brezhnev, okay, the leader of the Soviet Union, decides he's going to overthrow him in, okay, in another coup. And he will put in an Afghan leader that is friendly to Moscow. So Brezhnev orders tens of thousands of Soviet combat troops to leave the Soviet Union and occupy the major cities inside Afghanistan in September, or well, in December of 1979. And the Soviets will control the cities in some of the main land routes that will allow them to move soldiers and supplies into the country. But that other 80% of Afghanistan is controlled by regional warlords who are not friendly to the Soviets. And this is where you get the Soviet-Afghan war where you have a puppet uh, Afghan Communist Party with the Soviets fighting against 80% of the population of the country. Okay. And then foreign volunteers who will come in to back up these insurgents. Now, what happens is the United States CIA, the Central Intelligence uh, Agency, uh, it has a lot of friends in the region. Uh, it works closely with the Pakistani intelligence service, their version of the CIA. It works with the Indian military intelligence organization. Uh, it works with a lot of the regional powers. And what the CIA will do was it uses agents uh, and its contacts with the Pakistani intelligence service to find these Afghan resistance groups and figure out who will be the best to use to fight against Soviet occupation. So the CIA is looking for resistance groups and they'll use the Pakistanis as the go-between to get money and weapons and agents into the country in order to help the Afghans overthrow the Soviet occupation. Now, the, the overall organization that springs up, uh, the overarching thing that's supposed to be in command of all these Afghan forces is the Afghan Mujahideen. Uh, this is a very loose network of different resistance groups. Uh, they're united basically by the fact that they are anti-communist and pro-Islamic. Beyond that though, they split over ideological and ethnic differences. Okay, so this Mujahideen is what's uh, the overall organization and there's money and weapons being funneled into that and then they funnel it into these smaller groups. But there is no overall commander of the resistance group. Okay, they are basically being commanded by individual leaders in different uh, frontiers, but there's no overarching ideology, okay? no command structure overall. The United States, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, China, Saudi Arabia, uh, the UAE will pour millions of dollars of actual currency and weapons into Afghanistan in order to help push the Soviets out. Uh, one of the people, uh, who puts together one of these foreign volunteer groups is Osama bin Laden. Okay, he is a uh, Saudi prince. Okay, he is a real estate uh, magnate. He, his family built their wealth off of real estate uh, and banking. He will organize uh, the financial uh, and in some cases the paramilitary units who will leave Saudi Arabia and the UAE to go fight directly in Afghanistan. Uh, this is a, news, a British newspaper from the International. This is in 1989. So this is after the Soviets have withdrawn. And it's Osama bin Laden on the right-hand side. 
anti-Soviet warrior puts his army on the road to peace. When fighting in Afghanistan against the Soviets ends, his resistance group, Al-Qaeda, doesn't leave. Some of it stays behind to help the Taliban take control of Afghanistan. Another group will leave as Central Asia and go into East Africa to help the pro-Islamic resistance groups there in Somalia and Sudan fight against their governments. And eventually they get kicked out of there and Al-Qaeda goes back to Afghanistan because they're wanted. Despite that common goal of expelling the Soviets, the Mujahideen are not a unified force. Different factions fight each other as much as they fight against the Soviets and the Afghan communists. Uh, it is a multi-way civil war where they're killing each other for control of the area. Because there's no unified command, the Soviets, when they do launch military operations against these different warlords, they may crush different paramilitary groups, but they can never ensure that they've destroyed everything in a region. So the Soviets will conduct an operation. They'll destroy a village, they'll destroy a military group, and then they leave to go back to the cities. The countryside then goes back to those resistance groups. This is a pattern that happens with the Soviets. It is a pattern that will happen with the UN and NATO forces. When the Soviets finally withdraw in 1989, there's no peace, even inside this kind of newly independent country. All of those warlords start fighting each other over who ultimately controls the country. And by the mid 1990s, the Taliban, which have been concentrated in the southern part of the country, they have the most fighters, they have the most money, and they have the most local support. They will push all the other groups out of power, and the Taliban will declare that they are the uh, emirate, uh, the Islamic emirate of Afghanistan, and they gain control of the country. The map that you're seeing, okay, the areas that have the red lines, those are the major roadways that the Soviets and Afghan communists will control. And you can see they basically just link up with the major cities. The darker gray line that you're seeing on either side of it, that's the only area that the Soviets and Afghans technically control. Everything else, that lighter gray area, that's all controlled by the Mujahideen fragment groups. So the Soviets have a very limited uh, zone of control. Unfortunately, that's going to happen when coalition forces come in after 2002. Between 1985 and 1987, so six years into the Soviet occupation, the Russians are trying to figure out how to get out, uh, but they really kind of don't know how to do it. They go through five of their own general secretaries from 1979 to 1987. And the last general secretary of the Soviet Union, the last person in charge of the Soviet Union, is Mikhail Gorbachev. He's the one who has to oversee the evacuation of Soviet troops from Afghanistan while he's negotiating with the United States in order to draw down nuclear uh, weapons stockpiles. He's also the one who has to oversee the catastrophe of Chernobyl. So he gets stuck with a really crappy end of the bargain when he goes through. From 1987 to 1989, he's just trying to get out of Afghanistan. He no longer cares about the communist regime that's there. He wants Soviet troops out because it has become incredibly unpopular inside the Soviet Union. Uh, in order to keep getting soldiers to go into Afghanistan, the Soviet Union has to rely on conscripts. A lot of those, uh, the draft basically, a lot of the people who are called up just never go to the Soviet military. So the Soviet army is being hollowed out fighting here. Once the Soviets leave in 1989, the fighting doesn't end. Those local warlords in Afghanistan start to consolidate their own power and then fight with each other instead of trying to form a unified government. By 1992, three years after okay, the Soviets have left, uh, the Mujahideen, okay, the lead overall area, they've managed to control the capital city of Afghanistan, Kabul, on the 16th of April, 1992. They uh, get rid of Mohammed uh, Najibullah, who was the leader of the Afghan communists. And what ends up happening is the Mujahideen says that they're founding, okay, the Islamic State of Afghanistan. Uh, it's going to go along Islamic lines, but it would be a representative government. 
that you'd have different ethnic groups each have their own political parties and they would vote, okay, direct representation to make sure this Islamic state survives. Some of the groups do not agree with this. Uh, one of them uh, is led by Omar Majid or Mullah Amar. He had been in Pakistan. He founded the Taliban, uh, not just the Afghan version of it, but also the Pakistani version of the Taliban uh, in 1994. By 1995, he and the Taliban controlled the entirety of the eastern and southern portions of Afghanistan. And he's pushing towards Kabul. He's wiping out all these different groups that don't support him. He is opposed by a man named uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud, who was a commander in the Afghan military. Uh, he had been part of this Islamic State government. Uh, he's the man on the uh, bottom left-hand corner. He basically forms a coalition with what's left of these other Mujahideen uh, pol political parties, and they form what's called the Northern Alliance. They will be the opposition to the Taliban from 1995 up to 2001. Okay, they are the, the last people standing, preventing the Taliban completely taking over control of the area. Uh, Musaud is going to be one of the key allies for the United States and the UN up until his assassination in 2001. Now the Taliban is fighting inside Afghanistan uh, against its fellow citizens. And Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden's terrorist group, there's a presence inside Afghanistan and they are still fighting okay, to help him. But the core of Al-Qaeda is fighting in East Africa, in Saudi Arabia, and they're conducting terrorist attacks against American targets. Okay, in the 1990s, they conduct car bombings of two different embassies in East Africa on the same day. Uh, and they end up destroying the buildings and kill a lot of the uh, American local workers in those areas. They also conduct a, a bombing of a US barracks in Saudi Arabia, which kills service members and their families. Uh, and the United States pressures the Sudanese and the Saudi government to expel Osama bin Laden and uh, Al-Qaeda from uh, Sudan and Saudi Arabia. He's given refuge in, and his group are given refuge in 1996 in Afghanistan. The Taliban and Al-Qaeda are not the same entity. Okay, that is something that the United States intelligence and government does not understand at that time and afterwards. The Taliban is completely different than Al-Qaeda. The Taliban was willing to give up Al-Qaeda, but it was denied that when they were going through negotiations in late 2001. Okay. Uh, you have the World Trade Center attacks uh, that take place September 11th, 2001, with both trade centers being destroyed, the Pentagon being severely damaged, another aircraft uh, being destroyed over Pennsylvania, uh, the result of being 2,999 people being killed including the 19 hijackers. The hijackers of, in this attack are mostly Saudi citizens and Egyptians and Lebanese and UAE citizens. There are no Afghans, there are no Iraqis, there are no Iranians who are part of these terror attacks. Okay. Uh, the US President George W. Bush, he, the, the intelligence services knows that Al Qaeda is hiding okay, inside Afghanistan he gives the Taliban an ultimatum. He tells the Taliban, hand over Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. Close down all of these different terrorist training camps that have been in your territory up to this point in time. Hand over all the terrorist leaders and their supporters and allow the United States to come into Afghanistan and maintain a military presence. The Taliban was willing to give Al-Qaeda up. Okay, there were members of the Taliban who were negotiating with the UN saying, okay, we're willing to give you these things. If the Taliban could stay in Afghanistan as part of a new government, okay, they didn't want to be expelled. While these negotiations are taking place, Omar uh, Malula, who is the head of this, uh, of the Taliban refuses. He cuts out the rest of the, the Taliban party and decides to resist the United States. And then he will be overthrown and pushed out of the region. The tribalism in Afghanistan is both a benefit and a detriment to the United States and UN forces coming in 
to overthrow the Taliban and get rid of Afghanistan. The tribalism in the rural areas, those small villages, again, for the most part, traditionally, it is the leaders of those cities, of those tribes, who control what happens inside that territory. And Kabul is just a, a distant ideology. It's there, it's the capital, but they don't send funds, they don't send police, they don't send uh, disaster relief. It's the local people who have to fix everything. And so what happens is depending on what region of the country you're in, that depends on how your alliance shifts. You can be allies to the Taliban one week and then allied to the central government in the United States the next, depending on how it actually is beneficial to you. So in the upper right-hand corner, that is one of these tribal villages. Okay, this is in the extreme rural areas. It's small, relatively underdeveloped, not a lot in the way of running water or power. But then at the bottom, you see the contrast. That is the skyline of Kabul, okay, with electricity moving towards kind of a, a, a second world standing, okay, modernization. So the United States comes in uh, with NATO and the UN in 2002. And between 2002 and 2005, the Taliban is expelled from most parts of the country. An interim government is set up in Afghanistan. And the United States also invades Iraq shortly thereafter. And a chunk of the military force that the US had earmarked for Afghanistan has to be taken out and put into Iraq in order to help that occupation survive. So the UN forces, the NATO forces that are in Afghanistan are stretched very thin. And between 2005 and 2006, the Taliban are able to rebound. They're able to start regaining more recruits and they start taking over that rural countryside. And what happens is, is the United States and its allies will conduct these airborne operations where they send helicopters into the rural areas and they conduct very successful military operations, but they're only tactical victories. They only wipe out small pockets of Taliban fighters. And those US troops go back to their base, just like the Soviets did in the 1980s. And then the Taliban regains control of those regions. And so what ends up happening is, is uh, the US and NATO have very strong areas of occupation and area denial but 80% of the country is wild and open to the Taliban. This situation just continues to deteriorate from 2005 onwards. You have three presidential administrations in the United States change and none of them have an exit strategy. There was a strategy to get them into the country, but nobody knows what the ultimate goal of getting out is. February 25th, 2019, there's peace talks between the Taliban and the United States in Qatar, in the Middle East. Okay, the co-founder of the Taliban, Abdul Ghani uh, Baradur, he goes to Qatar to meet with US officials. The problem with this is this goes from February to December of 2019. The people who are not invited to these peace talks is the Afghan interim government. Okay, the government that's allied to the United States is not brought into these talks. So they do not know what the US negotiation is between the Taliban and the United States. The Afghan interim government cannot survive without American support. Okay, so they're completely cut out. Okay. Uh, eventually, you have another round of talks that take place uh, in February of 2020. Uh, and at the end of February, February 29th, 2020, the United States and Taliban signed a conditional peace agreement, which allows the United States forces to withdraw from Afghanistan and the Taliban will not attack them. The Taliban will only go after Afghan okay, government forces and military forces. US forces will be allowed to withdraw without being attacked. And at the bottom, you can see, okay, the man on the right, that's Mike Pompeo, President Donald Trump's Secretary of State, and the man on the right, that is Abdul Ghani Bahardar. This is after they made the peace agreement, okay, just between the Taliban and the United States, allowing the Taliban basically control of the country, and the U.S. Would, would withdraw its forces by August of 2021, regardless of whether President Trump was in second term or there was a new administration. The deal for the U.S. withdrawal 
was already done before the 2020 elections took place. Now, when this happens, okay, the Taliban ceases fighting against the United States and UN. And what it does is it starts concentrating on this opposing Afghan government's military forces. There has been such frustration over the corruption uh, inside okay, this uh, Afghan government that most regular Afghans go behind, some of them will go behind the Taliban just because they want a normalization of life. They want a secession of fighting. There's been fighting for the better part of 42 years, from 1979 to 1921. They want a ceasefire. By May 21st, 2021, the Taliban control 90% of the country. And by the time it gets to August, 2021, okay, the last overland route between Kabul, uh, the, the Afghan interim government and the outside world is cut off. By August 15th, okay, Taliban forces advance into the city of Kabul inside the capital. They get to the presidential palace and by the evening they've declared a new government. They declare that the Taliban has taken the country back over. And between August 15th and August 22nd, there are mass airlifts to try to get as many people who had worked alongside the United Nations and the United States out of Kabul as possible. But again, this timeline for this evacuation, it had already been agreed upon before President Joe Biden even came into office. He had to get these people out as fast as he could. Okay, and right now, uh, the Taliban is in control of Afghanistan. So far, not very many countries have actually recognized its rule. Uh, the Taliban have sent uh, ambassadors to the United Nations, hoping for official recognition and hoping for some form of official diplomatic recognition uh, so that they could get back into the world market. Uh, they could get back into uh, basically hoping to modernize this country. And so right now, the, the disorder in Afghanistan, this has been a 42 year process, but basically it's been a civil war with outside forces coming in, backing up one group or the other. Uh, and that's where uh, this particular uh, talk ends. And like I said, this is not an exhaustive talk by any means. Uh, you could have entire you know, conferences on any part of this and still have questions. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and then open it up to comments or questions.